Aren't you glad for Jesus? Yes. Where would we be, for heaven's sakes? <laughs> you know, we're talking about, we're seeing this song that when rise, you know, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. But Jesus' kingdom, yes. Jesus Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, what's going to happen with that? You just sang it. Yes. It's not going to fall. It withstands them all. Amen. And you know, when we think about the kingdom of God, we think about the church. We are constantly, constantly thinking about something up in heaven coming down. The kingdom of God is going to be established. Jesus Christ is going to bring the kingdom of God with him. No, 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 no. That's not what the book says. Either we're going to go with the book or we're going to miss out on so, so much. The kingdom of God has already come. The kingdom of God is a living reality in every born-again, spirit-filled believer. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. And if you don't believe it, then you're not believing the Lord. And you're not living in agreement with what He said. For He said, the kingdom of God is not coming with observation, but it's a spiritual dimension, a living reality within every believer. It's in you. It's in you. It's already here. So if that is true, what in the world are we afraid of? What are we so concerned about with what hell is doing today in this world? We should fear nothing. Because we are victory in action. Victory in action. Years and years ago, I knew a brother Settles. He was Bishop Settles. And one day he called me up. He says, Doc, guess what I'm going to be doing? I said, what are you going to be doing, Bishop Settles? He says, the church is meeting on Wednesday nights. And we're going to have them tell whatever it is that they have experienced in their physical being, in their lives. If you've been raped, if you've been uh, shot at, if you've got... Whatever it is, you're going to bring that message with you on Wednesday night. And then we're going to separate and we're going to go out into Montgomery County. He says Montgomery County is rabid with sin and death and rapes and you name it. He says we're going to make a difference. We're calling it Sonship in Action. When I heard what you were what you were doing with boots on the ground, I mean, hey, this is the same thing, and it makes a difference. Yes. So, what did Bishop Settles do just before they started this? He went to the chief of police of Montgomery County, and he announced to him, "This is what we're going to do. Our church." is going out and spreading around every area of the county. And we're going to pull down the strongholds of sin and degradation. The chief of police says, well, that's nice. Do you know what's happening here? And he says, that's why we're going. And we're going to make a difference. I said, God bless you, Bishop. Go for it. So anyways, they did it. They started going out. And a year later, a year later, how many? All right. He picked up, I picked up the, uh, the, the paper that, that dealt with Montgomery County. And do you know what it said? All of the situations that we've been facing in Montgomery County is changing. 
He says, everything that has, has been happening, this is from the chief of police. Everything that has evil has been happening, he says, it's been reversed. And it's not happening any longer. So I shouted, I said, hey, Bishop, what's happening in Montgomery? He told me, he says, we're shouting, we're jumping around, we're shouting glory to God. We're seeing Jesus change things. Because we're praising, we're worshiping, we're going out, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, pulling down the strongholds of evil and the wicked one. Well, Franklin Graham just said, Franklin Graham, he's a good Baptist. I didn't know he believed in demons and all that. But he said, Franklin Graham just said that hell has poured out, poured out its demonic influence and demonic emissaries in America and is spreading to the entire world. Every country is being invaded by these demonic forces. And what is the church doing about it? Well, when where's, where's Zachary? Is Zachary here? Hi, Zachary. One day, my wife was in Africa. And I was invited to come down and spend with my, my time while she's there with the Baldinis. So one day, I'm always looking for a, a, a sermon title. Got to get something that's exciting or whatever. And so David, my son-in-law, came over and he says, Dad, Zachary, now Zachary was about four feet shorter and three or four years younger. And he says, I'm taking... Zachary, I'm sure you remember this, David, to the library. It's within walking distance. Would you like to go? Hey, anything about books? I'm ready to go. So I said, sure. So we went. And Zachary was playing the games at the library. And what was I doing? I was going around looking at book after book, after books, titles in the books. And I wrote one right here, way back then. And it's been in the archives <laughs> for years. And it was called The Tarnished City. I thought, that'll, that'll preach. The Tarnished City. Father, we thank you today that we can come together in the precious name of Jesus Christ, knowing that you are Lord of all, that you have been seated in the heavenlies, but that's not just where you're seated. You are seated in every believer. You have endeavored to make us to understand that that glorious kingdom of God is already at work in the earth through the vessels that you have died for, and that you rose again for. We thank you that we were able to come together today and to sense the presence of God. I sense presence here today. And I know that you're here. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. A year and a half, two years after Bishop Settles told me and what I read about the sin and evil and the debauchery that was going in going on in in the county I said I read another piece of literature on what was happening in Montgomery County I called up Bishop and I said Bishop Settles, I was so excited when you told me about Sonship in Action and what was going on. I just read that 
the wickedness in Montgomery County has risen to an all-time high. What happened? And he said, Doc, you're not going to believe this. I said, wait a minute. God doesn't fool around. God honors the declarations of his people. But he said, a year and a half ago, the people came to me and said, we're just tired. We're so tired. We're so tired. And they stopped doing it. What does that say to you and me today? What does that say to you and to me today? What does the book say about the church of Jesus Christ? We are a chosen people. We have been set apart for the presence of God to dwell in. Several years ago, here, and I think it wasn't here, maybe it was just in Florida. But I said, I believe that you are God's address. You are God's address. What do you mean? We always put God way up there in the heavenly somewhere when all along, hey, is Jesus Christ God incarnate in the flesh or isn't He? Yes. Yes, he is. Jesus, the book says, Jesus declared Himself to be God, the Father. God dwelling in Him. God, the Bible says that he was the manifest presence of God. That God's entire virtue dwelt in Jesus Christ. The Paul said it this way, the fullness of God dwells in Christ physically. It's there. It's who he is. He also said, I am just travailing in my spirit, Paul said. I'm travailing in my spirit. That word travail means like a woman giving birth in pain. But something awesome is happening. Life, new life is emerging. And he finished his statement, Paul said, I travail in my spirit until Christ be formed in you. Beloved, there's something happening in every one of us. There is a formation. If when we understand who Jesus was, John said it this way, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you believe that? Yes. Wave your Holy Ghost hand at me if you believe that. All right. Those of you who didn't, don't make me come out there. <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say today? When God in the beginning said, let there be light. Who was talking? Who was operating through the mouth of Almighty God? The one who is called the Word. Jesus. When Jesus got here, He said, no man has seen God but the Son manifests Him in totality. A little bit of a twist there, but you know what it says. You know what I'm saying. Sometimes you've got to bring it down to where we're living. And that terminology that I read on that book title one day, The Tarnished City, I 
If you got your Bibles, all right. I got you. I gotta put on my spectacles here. Matthew five and fourteen. You are the light of the world. Jesus was talking to the church that day. He said, you are the light of the world. Matthew 5 and 14. And he said, a city, a city that cannot be hid. The first thing that he ever called the city or the church or the believer was a city. You are the light of the world, a city that cannot be hidden. We're not to be shut up in our own little world. Each one of us has that little world. Every one of us has it. Every one of us has it. That little world that is ours and don't anybody dare to come into it and try to disturb it. It's my world. And I'll live it the way I want to live it. I don't care what God says. You would never say that. But your attitude, if you are not out there busy about your father's business, hello, I'm not mad at you. I'm just excited today to be here with you. Because I love you. Some of you, I, I think I'm old most of you. I don't know those ten- Tennesseans back there. But glory to God, I think one of you I saw before. All right? But you understand what I'm trying to say? We must not be the tarnished city. Tarnished. What does tarnished mean? It means to bring something dirty. To be effective and bring something dirty to the situation. I wrote this. I looked it up. Let me just tell you what I read. Oh, I just had surgery on the eyes, and this thing's driving me nuts. Let me just read it here. To lose its luster. To lose its luster. To cause to become dirty or damaged. To dull. To cause to fade. To diminish. Or to destroy, tarnished. To destroy the purity. To cast a stain on an otherwise, oh, get this. You ought to write this one down. To cause a stain on an otherwise original design. An original design. I want to talk to you about four P's. Four P's. The plan of God. What is God's plan? What was God's plan in the original, in the beginning? In the beginning. You see, when God allowed the Son, or the Word, as He was known while He was in the Son, in the, in the, in the bosom of the Father, when God spoke, and then they had, I call it the big three meeting in the heavens, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are eternal. They never, ever had to bother with time. But this, this is a Roselle found, uh, uh, version here. Where did time come from? This is what I think. At that big meeting in the sky, or in the heavens, in that place called eternity, where there is no beginning and 
no ending, is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As the Word spoke and God made the decision, He said, let's make things happen around here. So what they did is, God took, stop, stop, eternity, just stop. We're going to take a piece here and a piece here, and we're going to call it time. And we're going to chop up in that time, days, weeks, months, years, decades, whatever, and in that portion of time, there is going to be a time of fulfillment and a time of beginning and ending. And now we're going to begin to make creation. And they began to speak. The word began to speak and things happened. They didn't have to make anything until it came to man. He spoke it and it came into existence. And then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Dominion over everything that we have created. I will be the superior. He shall be the one in charge under me. There is nothing that God did not know, and there is nothing that takes God by surprise. Do you understand that? Nothing takes God by surprise. And so, he understood. He understood that we're fickle. Man is fickle. Sometimes we say one thing and do another. Sometimes we say out of the side of our mouth or in our heart, we love you, Jesus. We praise you. You did it this morning. And as we were praising God, I felt an incredible presence from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I was just trembling like this because the presence of God was so real in our praise and our worship. Because that's where He dwells. In our praises. and In our worship. There ought to be no reason why we do not sense the presence of God, especially when we come together as the corporate body of the living Christ. Each one of us comprise a portion of the body of Christ, and every one of you have an important part to play. Don't ever believe the lies of the devil. Don't ever Allow Him to remind you of yesterday. Do not ever come to another member of the body of Christ and dare to bring the past up. God help us today. If we do that, we are in absolute discre discrediting the, per the work of Jesus Christ in the body of Christ. You may not like somebody, it's even a Christian, but shut your mouth and don't you dare ever, ever to remind them of yesterday. The pastor of our church where we assemble, he called us up one, called me up one day and he says, I want you to help me in prayer on Sunday. I said, all right. And so we went there. He said, when I give the altar call, your wife, you come. Come up. I honor you, and I believe that you're men and women of God, and I want you to help me pray. So we went up there, and there was this one guy who was up and down, up and down, up and down. And as I was praying for him, God said, tell him he has no yesterdays. He has no yesterdays. There is only 
today. Live in today's presence of God. Beloved, this said it all to me. This said it all to me. Because the enemy, the devil wants to bring up your past. The devil wants to tell you your shortcomings. Oh, you think you're going to do something for God? Look what you were. Look what you've done. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus said. He set the dimension of our faith and the power of who we are in Christ. In ourselves, in that flesh, we have nothing. But in Christ, we are being restored. What was gone is being restored. Here a little, there a little maybe. But there is a work of God. A work of the Holy Spirit that is going on within our spirit. And there is a dimension of responsibility that every one of us has. And that is to hear the Word of God. Who's the Word of God? Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, who has now arrived on the scene, He always was around. But in the Old Testament, the only ones who could hear from the Holy Spirit were the high priests, and kings could get word from the Holy Spirit. And that was an outward experience for them. But now, with the ascension of Jesus Christ to his rightful position on the throne, he released the Holy Spirit to increase his presence. And now, he lives within us. And you and I and every believer has the right to hear from the Holy Spirit in our spirit. And then to allow the Spirit of God to read, to, to open up the reality of who Jesus Christ is. Not just the Lord sitting on the throne. All right? There's a chorus that we sing down, I'm sure you sing it here, about Jesus didn't want to be in heaven by himself. So what did he do? He brought heaven down. When did he do that? On the cross. On the cross. When he paid the price, when he paid. I was telling someone the other day, you know, I'm just thinking about that day when the Godhead made man. And I believe that this is Rosalism again. I kind of think that there was a conversation that is not written in there about what happened when they made man. Jesus says, you know, they're fickle. Holy Spirit says, you ain't kidding there, G. And the Father says, I know. But I've got a plan. We're going to have fellowship. And the Godhead says, yes. The God is in total agreement. There's no separation in the Godhead. And they had this ability to see beyond time because they're eternal. They know the whole story. We're getting a little deep here. Stay with me. Don't let me lose you. All right? And so, the Word says, I know they're fickle. And I know what they're going to do. 
God says, yeah, we all do. Spirit ch- 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 the Spirit ch- chips in and says, yeah, I know. I know. Every time you spoke, I had to do something. And I knew because we're eternal. We see the beginning that they have to the ending that they're going to have. Something's going to be required of one of us. Something's going to be required of one of us. And the Word said, are you following me here? The Word said, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. And God says, Son, this ain't going to be a walk in the park. (laughs) You understand this? You said you'd go. This is not going to be a walk in the park. You realize what's got to happen. I know. And I will pay the price. And I can imagine the tears must have run down that day when God was so proud of the word. He had to speak it for it to come to pass. He had to speak it for it to come to pass. And when he set that in place, The book of Genesis says, I'm going to put division between you and the woman, between your seed and his seed. The seed of the woman is going to bruise your heel. But the seed, your seed, Jesus, your seed is going to bring an end of all sin. It's going to erase, it's going to erase the failures of all those pieces of clay. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you today? There was an original, there was an original, but somehow, It got tarnished in our understanding or in our flesh, but definitely in our flesh. And he's trying to make us understand that my first plan was to come down and get personal with you. God's first plan. Genesis tells us in the third chapter that he used to come down in the cool of the day. I don't believe that God personally came down, but what I I believe, I believe was the voice of God in the garden. How many of you ever heard the voice of God? Uh Uh-huh. I'm not talking about, hey, son, how are you today? You know, know. but you have sensed the presence. Have you ever been driving in your car and just felt the presence of God slip in? We were driving in Africa one day, and this was during the war. There was some of the army left in there that were... They didn't like the whites. And we were down in a place called Bulawayo, which means, by the way, the the place of blood. And we were ministering down there. Some of our students had come from there, and they were ministering. And as we were driving, there was a big truck of army men in front of us. 
And they were sitting to us, and they went like this. They looked over their shoulder at the road ahead. And they said, come on. You, can, you know, in other words, you can pass right here. You, we, I never pass on a hill. But this day, the whole truck, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. So I pulled out, and the Spirit of God said, pull in. Immediately. As I pulled out, he said, pull in, and I did. And they're going, what's the matter with you? And as I did, a huge lorry came whizzing down around that bend. You would have been wiped out, my wife, myself, and our three kids. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was active. We have got to come to that place, beloved, to where we are so sensitive of the original work of God and what He made. And though we messed up, and even though we may be messing up now, His purpose for fellowship has never ended. It is still in operation. And wherever you go, you have the privilege of being able to speak with God. His voice is still speaking in this. He is not mute. God through the Spirit and through the Son is still speaking. And He's urging us, urging us to be real with Him and to let Him be formed in you. Just like Paul said, I travail in my spirit until. There is always an in, until. Okay? There is always an until. But he knows what he's doing. And he knows what he wants to accomplish in each one of our lives. He knows what his, the plan has been. And the plan is for fellowship. We must Fellowship Him in praise and in worship. That was the first one. Second one, God's plan, God's purpose. God's purpose is to destroy the works of the devil. First, Genesis 3.15 gave us the promise Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between thee and the woman and I'm going to let her seed injure you, Jesus. But then you're going to overcome the works of darkness. Alright? You have something going on in your life, in your very being, in your very nature. Your nature when you gave your heart to Christ, changed. And what it changed into was the sinless, sinless, say sinless, sinless nature of the Son. When He died and rose again, I think we all understand that, don't we? That when Jesus Christ died, rose again, and presented His blood, He didn't just present himself. He took his blood. He said, Father, I did it. And the heavens were opened on that day. I'm working on a series right now. I'm teaching it in Florida. An open heaven. And what an open heaven means to each one of us. And on that day, when Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened, and the Word of God came forth and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased. 
When he died, when he died, he had paid the ultimate price of our redemption. Redemption. There are three R's here. Three R's. It's tough getting to be 83. Redemption. The next great thing is restoration. All that was lost is being restored into our very being. Into our very existence. It's being restored. It had been battered. It may have been tarnished. The city, us, the church, the representation of God's plan and purposes. He is restoring it all back to its original and even better position that we had. Do we realize who we are? Do we realize our true identity? I've preached it here for 12 years. I've preached it now for 12 years down there. Pastor asked me one day, just prior to we asked before asking me if I teach the adult class. He says, What do you believe God is saying? Or what do you think? What do you think God is saying? I said, Well, I know what he's saying to me. He said, And what is that? He said, I want you to tell the people who they are. I want you to bring them to a place of personal identity with Jesus Christ and all that God has in store. I said, he's been saying that to me for 35 years, 40 years, more now. That was, I guess it is more now. Wow. And so I'm still doing it. I said, Pastor, that, that's what he's saying to me. So he says, would you teach the adult class? I said, are you sure? He said, yes. I said, okay. He says, we don't have to agree on everything, he says to me. Because I was sort of holding back. Because the Church of God, you know, Assembly of God, Church of God, they're pretty much the same. So I said, all right, but I'll tell you one thing, Pastor. I will never, ever stab you in the back. I will never do that. I'll leave before I do that. Before I ever try to teach something that you do not believe. Okay. So the first few times that I taught, I gave him my notes completely. Because as you know who are in this church, I hand out notes and you fill in this, the blanks. That's how I teach. And so I gave him notes first. <laughs> it, there were four pages and it took me three months to teach it. I don't know anybody else like that, do you? Well, I just started an open heaven, and I've got eight pages. It took me three weeks just to do the introduction. But that's part of the game. <laughs> that's part of the teaching. Trying to bring something that's up here in the heavenlies to where we understand what we possess and the power, resident power, that is in every one of us. All right? God's purpose to destroy the works of the enemy. 
And he's not doing it alone. He did it on the cross. And he won it when he presented his blood to the Father. But now there is a responsibility. There's another R. Now there is another responsibility that is placed upon every one of us. Woe be it if we reject that responsibility. Because when he tells you to witness and you don't, you're going to pay a price. You're going to pay a price. When I was in Bible college, I was walking over to a place to get a hot dog. (laughs) And I had one thought. I'm going to go get a hot dog. Somebody just gave me $2 and I can get a hot dog and a Coke. I was going over there. It was in between classes. And as I passed the big high school that was right there near the Bible class school, there was a man standing there in rags. And I didn't witness to him. My head, my ideas, my thoughts were on getting over. I'm a Bible college student. I should know these things. To be eager to share the word. But I was hungry and I wanted a hot dog. So I went and I got the hot dog. I enjoyed it. It came back and I saw a crowd of people standing. I went, what's happening? What's happening? And so I edged my way in, and there was that man lying dead on the ground. His blood is going to be required in my hand when I go to heaven. Because I was disobedient, and I didn't obey what the Spirit of God said. You understand what I'm trying to say today? There is a responsibility that God places on every one of us. I've wept and I have tortured myself with that for years and years and years. And I believe what the Bible, what, what the, the devil said to me. And, you know, there comes a time when we have to repent. We have to repent. Of the flesh. There's something happening on the planet right now. I believe what Franklin Graham said that hell has vomited forth all of its demonic forces right now, all of what he has kept in store toward the end because he knows his end. And unlike the Universalist Church, everybody is not going to be saved on the last day. There are going to be many who do not make it. And if we don't preach or share or testify, many people are not going to make it. And again, I'm telling you, I'm not angry. I'm just, I am passionate about what we need to do and understand and acknowledge who we are And then go out and do what we have to do to the devil in his hells. His angels are going to be falling before the feet. He says, do you not know that you're going to judge angels? How many of you read that? Or you skip it over quite quickly? I used to quickly skip it over because who am I to judge an angel for crying out loud? But the Bible says the believer... Going to judge angels. You see, you have been given an awesome privilege and identity. Do not forget who you are, but stand strong in the knowledge of who you are and what others are around you who have paid the price of allowing the flesh. 
to rule them. Are you hearing me today? All right. The promise, the purpose, destroying the works, and then finally, God's passion. Do you know, do you know what God's passion is? God's passion. What's passion? Passion is an intense desire. An intense sense of reality. I passionately love that woman over there. If somebody messes with her, one time we were sitting at a dinner table across from two individuals. And one of them said something that sort of brought my wife into the message. And I, you can touch me, do anything you want. Don't touch my family. It's a warning. <laughs> Don't touch my family. And so I said, just a minute. And I whop, right in my shins, my wife. Shut up. That's what the, that's what the kick meant. Don't say anything. And I stopped dead in my tracks, not only because of the pain, but what I knew would have to come later if I kept talking. Don't mess with mama or no, you're, you, you know. So I thought, what she said bugged me. That was my flesh. But it was also my defender. I'm going to defend that woman. Regardless. But all of a sudden, things changed. The whole realm. But I didn't hold back one little portion. I said, don't ever touch the family. I said that over the beating pain in my shin. But anyways, we, uh, we dealt with it, as far as I dared to go. <laughs> God's passion, the last P. God's passion is you. God is passionate about you. If you don't believe it, there's a scripture that says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only begotten son. He allowed the word to die. Think of it. Jesus, prior to Calvary, was the Word. He was known as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. You see how passionate He is for us. Willing to allow His Son part of the Godhead, part of God himself, to die the most ignominious death that was known in that day. The cross. The Romans had got it to a, a, a maximum. They knew how to make it prolonged for hours and hours before death came. The Word, the Word was experiencing that. 
And the Word said, what did the Word say? Father, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Word had never known a separation between the Godhead. Had never experienced it. But on that day, he did. And God, the Bible says, had to turn his back on the Son. Because God cannot look upon evil. And let it live. He paid the price. But nevertheless, not my will, because I be done, and into thy hands I commend my spirit. He knew for three long, torturous days he would lie in that grave experiencing the torment and the victorious cries of hell over what he had just done. We did it! We did it! We killed this thing! You see, God said, this holy thing, hello, to Mary, this holy thing, this holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And yet hell was saying, this thing, we killed this thing. We finally did it. We can shout victory. Uh-oh. <laughs> did somebody just see his finger twitch? <laughs> Did somebody just see an eye winker? You know, go. And Jesus came out of that grave. He walked over to Satan. Give me the keys of the kingdom. You've had them long enough. Now I'm going to give them to the kingdom. Hallelujah. Do we understand what he did for us? What he did to us? So many times... We're going through some pressures. Hear me when I say this. I just wrote it down this morning. The Lord God said this to me. He says, listen, let, let the furnace of affliction purify you. When you are going through the furnace of affliction, and you will, at some point in your life, you will feel the pressure. Anybody feeling pressure these days? God said, once again, I will not only shake the heavens, but I will shake the earth. I'm doing the shaking. The devil is not. I am doing the shaking. I'm putting on the pressure. I'm, put, I'm building up the furnace. But it's not to destroy you. It's to bring you to a place of understanding of how much of you is still flesh. How much of you is still holding on to those things that don't glorify God. How much of you, how much of you is Christ. Being manifested from your mouth, from your life, from your heart. How much of you? This is what is being shaken. Shaken. Shaken until you're sick of it. Sick of what? The shaking? Yeah. But sick of letting the flesh have its way. That choice is yours and that choice is mine. 
Every one of us seated here are still allowing the flesh to rule in some areas. Maybe you have a lot of victory over self. You know, one thing that God hates is pride. Because pride will not allow you to deal with your flesh or your fleshly feelings. Because you want to retain them, you have all kinds of excuses why you have to allow it to happen. Hear me, church. Asking you, take one more step higher. The flesh is the lowest of all evils. It caused Christ's death. Self-preservation. Preservation is the strongest instinct in the flesh. You have to tear it away from you. One time that Jesus was teaching, he said, I'm coming to a close. One of the things that Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Hello? Now doesn't that excite you? I just had eye surgery. This one went well, this one not quite so well because I felt the pain as they were working. It didn't, it didn't give me enough of the joy juice, I guess. But the doctor kept saying, it's only 10 minutes, <laughs> which seems like 10 hours. But, you know, so anyways, he's an excellent doctor and he did a really good job. So that's why I don't have to wear glasses all the time now. If I was sitting up here, I could, couldn't see you out there very well for 12 years up here because I was nearsighted, all right? But now I can see you. He asked me, what do you want? You want to keep nearsighted or to be able to see far off? I said, I want to see the guy sitting back there so I can look at him and point my finger at him. <laughs> Hi, Phil. Love you, Phil. <laughs> you. <laughs> you. You. You know what I'm saying? I can see you guys up here so I can get at you. you know. So I said, no, I want to see off and you'll, you'll need readers. Said, That's fine with me. That's what I'm using readers up here. But you understand? He, God, was passionate about you and he loved you enough to pay the price. He's so passionate about you, he has made us kings and priests. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Chuck over in England hasn't got anything on us. <laughs> he may have suffered, he may have gotten all those things in, you know, coronation. But you are a king. You are a priest. Hallelujah. And we're going to rule and reign with Jesus right here on this earth. You and I have got some work to do. Hello. We got some of that restoration to be allowed to make us. You know, God's doing something. He's bringing you into himself. If you're willing to hold on to your self-nature, and that's what it is when you don't let go of it, it's yourself, and it costs Christ his life. Because you wouldn't let go. You enjoyed the flesh. I do not enjoy the flesh. Yes, you do. If you won't let go of it. Sorry for letting it get a little bit shout. But we've got to do it sometimes, Pastor. To make it come in to the inner man. If we don't release it, he is not going to come down and rip it out of your chest or rip it out of your mind. You've got to deal with it. That's what the shaking is doing this 
time of the year. This time of the fullness of time. And the last thing I said in my class there, there is another fullness of time upon us right now. Choose ye this day. Well, I choose Jesus. Then why are you acting and allowing that thing to rule over you, to govern you? Whoever you yield your members to, they're the governing agent over you. Let's get rid of it. Let's let Jesus grow. Especially in the difficult times of your life. The pressures. The times you're alone and you're weeping. Jesus is right there saying, you know, sometimes you just got to let the tears flow. And you're not alone. You're not alone. Let the tears flow. And tell Jesus, thank you for not being alone in this. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me the opportunity to go through this. I hate it. I despise what I'm having to go through. But I know you're greater than any situation that I would have that I've had to endure and go through. And in you, I'm full. In you, I am free from all of those things that are trying to shake me up. And I finally surrendered. Finally surrendered. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Father, allow us today to have ears to hear what the church is saying under what the Father is saying under the church. Let us give freely of those things which want to hold on and hold so dear. I would like to ask if there's anyone here this morning you sense that the enemy has been after you? You sense that sometimes you have fought with God and asked why. And he, refer, he responds by saying that if you want to ask me, ask me. I've taken care of your sins. I've taken care of your sorrow. I have taken care of your hurts. Let them go. Let me have your hurts. I took them all. Your pain. What you don't understand. Let me have my way. Because you are precious to me. My passion is for you. Just stand to your feet if you would with me. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And if you've had some things that you just didn't understand, just stand. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins, though your disappointments, the Whatever it is, I'll take care of it. I may take care of it by shaking you up a bit, but I just want to know how much of you, of me, is in you now. And I want you to know it. Father, search our hearts. Search our lives. We come to you in the name of Jesus. If you're asking God for help, stand to your feet with me. If you're asking God for understanding for all this stuff, 
Stand to your feet with me today. It doesn't mean you're sinners. It doesn't mean you're evil, you're wicked. You just want to ask God to help you. Do you need his help today in anything? God hates pride. Thank you. God hates pride. God hates it. God looks at Christ sitting on the throne and he looks over at him and he shakes his head. What have I got to do to get through to them? They still won't admit they're imperfect. We are perfect in Christ, but the flesh wants to raise its ugly head every now and then. And you're having trouble with that. Stand up. Tell God about it. Let him take care of it. Father, today you see the hearts that are honest. You see the hearts that are facing you. Facing you and asking for your help. Asking for your understanding. Give them understanding. Allow the Holy Spirit to move upon them and to lead them into truth. Lead them into a deeper experience and a a deeper walk with you as they cry out to you. Honestly, honestly as they cry out to you and they let you work the work if you want the word to work you've got to word the work work the word in Jesus name Amen Praise God